Howdy, SEO Mouse fans. Welcome to another edition of Whiteboard Friday. This week, we're talking about advanced on-page optimization. Specifically, I have five tactics for you that go beyond the traditional, I'm going to put my keyword in the title tag, I'm going to put my keyword in the URL, those kinds of things. Uh, first one, starting out, is this idea of semantic connectivity. We've talked about this in the past. Uh, we did some research a couple years ago, uh, about maybe 18 months ago, on LDA, which is latent direct Dirichlet, Dirichlet allocation, uh, which of course is a form of topic modeling that we, we suspected Google might be using. And it's a way to imagine the, the connections between words in a particular, particular language. So I'll give you an example. Here's the word cat. And the word cat is probably closely related to the word feline. If you were a search engine and you saw a document with the word cat and the word feline, you would think that document is more relevant to a query for the word cat than a document that has the word cat and the word uh, whiteboard, which maybe, maybe that would be very far away. Right? So here's cat and here's canine, and those are much more distant. But cat is relatively closer to tiger, but it's a, even a little closer to meow. So you get, this, you get this sort of sense of, ah, the search engines have a graph of all the words in a language set how they're connected to each other, what, what's relevant to what, phrases, not just individual words, but, but two word, three word, four phrases. This kind of thing can be very helpful if you're looking at a document and you're saying to yourself, boy, you know, I talk about cats, but I forgot to mention anything about what they eat or what family they're in or uh, what they're related to. I didn't even use the word pets. Huh, maybe I should be optimizing for those types of things. And employing those closely connected terms right, can help to boost the relevancy and help boost your rankings. Second thing on the list, block level optimization. There's a great UMOS post about this that we promoted to the main blog recently, talking about precisely this type of thing where search engines will essentially analyze individual portions of a page. They'll look at, oh, you know, here, here's a sidebar, and we've decided that's not really relevant because that's navigational links, or here's the Here's the top nav that we're not going to analyze that for relevancy as much potentially. But you know, we're going to look at the header of the document, sort of where the headline is, those first few sentences. We're going to look at the middle of the document, maybe in paragraph forms, the footer of the document, the end. Is, are all of those things talking about the topic? Are they all on the subject? Or is this something that starts out talking about tigers, but then eventually gets, in, gets into a discussion on uh, genetically modified foods? If that's the case, maybe it's less relevant to tigers. It's just that the initial headline looked like it was relevant to tigers. And so therefore, we don't want to rank this document for the word tigers. We might even want to be ranking it for something like genetically modified foods. It just happens to use that catchy title. So make sure that your document, right, do, do this kind of check for all of these sections, making sure that they're pertinent, that they're relevant to the content of the, of the query, that they're serving the visitor's interests and needs. If you have that kind of off-topic diatribe, and I'm not saying you can't go off-topic in your writing a little bit and you know, explore some storyline themes, particularly if you have a long expository piece or you're writing a, a sort of narrative blog post, that's great. I'm just saying that for stuff that's hyper-targeting a particular keyword, especially for commercial intent or navigational intent, this, this might not be ideal. You might want to make those more focused. Number three, internal and external links. I'm not talking about the links pointing to the page. I'm talking about the links that actually exist on the page. So you remember uh, some folks from Google have actually in the past said that, yeah, we might have some things, some first order or second order effect things in our algorithm that rewards people who link out, meaning link to other websites. Marshall Simmons from the New York Times was on a Whiteboard Friday a couple years ago. And Marshall talked about how when the New York Times changed their policy to put more external links on the page, right, off to other websites, they actually saw increases, boosts in rankings from the articles that did that, strongly uh, confirming what Google had said about there being some sort of effect in the algorithm, maybe not directly, but indirectly, looking at, hey, is, is this person linking out, or are they linking out to good places? If they are, we might want to reward them. And so another optimization tactic that's on the more advanced side is putting good external links referencing relevant, potentially useful content on your pages. And linking out to other people is a wonderful thing, too, because it puts you into the ecosystem. What I mean by that is you link to someone else, other people go and visit that page. They might be talking about it. They might thank you for the reference. Someone might see that on Twitter. They might look in their analytics and see that you've sent visitors over and come check out your page and then link to something you've done. That reciprocation is very, very powerful in the organic web. And 
it can be useful not only for this direct relevancy boosting signal, but also from a links perspective, from a traffic perspective. Number four on the list, the happiness of visitors to a page. I know what you're thinking, it's sort of like, wait a minute, that's not, that's not on page optimization, that's more like conversion rate optimization. Yes, but it matters for rankings because Google is looking so much at usage and user data. I'm gonna ask uh, Kenny who's filming this video, I'm gonna wave Kenny, that's a, that's a great wave. Did you all see that? He looked great, it's amazing. Uh, I'll ask Kenny to put in a link to a Quora thread where a Google engineer, someone who worked at Google, actually talked about how they use machine learning on user and usage data signals uh, in the potential ranking algorithm to help better stuff come up uh, when, when the rankings uh, may be ordered normally just by their classic sort of on page and links stuff and, and these types of things. That means that if I can make visitors happier, if I can boost the, the value of what they're getting out of the pages, I can potentially rank higher too. Not just convert more of them, but even improve in rankings. And so we're talking about things like, you know, are these visitors completing actions? Are they spending more time on this site or page uh, uh, on average with a good experience than they are with others? And, and what I mean by this, it, it's not just, oh, my time on site is low, I need to find ways to keep visitors on there you know, a longer time. Maybe you have something that's answering a very, very short query in a short amount of time and that's making visitors happy. And maybe you have something that's answering that query but after a long period of time and visitors are actually unhappy and they're going back to Google and clicking, you know what, block all results from this site, I don't want to see it anymore. Or they see you in the rankings in the future and they're like, oh, I remember that domain. Oh, I, didn't, I do not want to go through that again. They had this annoying ads and the overlays and they blocked me from going there. You know, every time I see Forbes, I'm always like, man, does this article look interesting enough to me to have to go through that you know, initial screen of the ad? Because I know I'm going to get it every time and it's going to take extra time to load. So on my phone, when I'm browsing the web, I'm always like, uh, I'm not going to click on that Forbes link. Maybe I'll check it later on my laptop or my desktop. So those types of things are signals that the engines can look at. Uh, are people coming back? Are they returning again and again? When they see this stuff through, you know, they've got 25% market share with Chrome, they've got the Google toolbar, they have Google free Wi-Fi, they have relationships with ISPs. So they can get this data, right, about where everyone goes, not just from search, but all over the web. They know what you're bookmarking, they know what you're returning to, they know your visit patterns. This kind of stuff is definitely gonna make its way into the algorithm, I think even more so than it does today. Fifth, and finally, some content uniqueness and formatting. So you're all aware of, of sort of duplicate content issues, thin content issues, the Panda stuff that happened earlier this year that affect a lot of websites. But what you may not know is that it, th there's a bunch of tactics that you can apply in an advanced on-page optimization scenario that can help. So things like completely unique. When I say completely unique, what I mean is not that you can't quote someone in here, but just that what you can't have is a sort of Mad Lib style SEO where you've got you know, X, Y, blank, Z, blank, A, B, C, blank. And it's fill in the city name, fill in the uh, proper name, fill in the, the name of the business. And that's the same across every page on your site or that's taken from a manufacturer's description and that's put in there. You need to have that uniqueness uh, throughout. And Google's very good at shingling, which is sort of a, a method for pattern detection inside topics uh, or inside content. Don't play with them. Just make sure that this is a highly unique piece. If you want to quote something, that's fine. If you want to use media or graphics from somewhere else, that's fine and reference those. I'm not talking about that, but I am talking about that sort of playing Mad Libs SEO is a dangerous game. We've noticed that longer content, uh, more content is literally, is quite well correlated with better rankings, particularly post Panda. What you saw is that uh, sites, I'll, I'll give you an example. So I look at a lot of rankings for restaurant sites because I'm constantly doing searches for restaurants uh, and types of food because I travel a ton. And when I, what I see is that, you know, Yelp and Urban Spoon do very, very well. City Search often does well. And then you'll see those independent individual blogs and when they tend to rank well when they're on page one is when they've written that long diatribe exploring all sorts of things on the menu with lots of pictures of the food and a, an experiential post versus a short snippet of a post you'll find those on page three page four page five they don't do as well that that longer in-depth content more of the uniqueness more value in the content uh, more that i can get out of it as a reader 
seems to be something that Google's picking up on. And I don't know if that's pure length. I don't know if that's something necessarily that looking at in the user and usage data. But it could be helpful if you're not ranking very well and you're thinking, boy, I have a lot of pages that are just short snippets. Maybe I'm going to try expanding some of them. Using images and media, we've, of course, seen the correlation with uh, alt attributes matching the keyword in images. That's not what I'm talking about necessarily. But using images on the page can create more of that uh, in-depth experience, can create a better relationship between you and the visitor. Those things could be picked up and used in other places, and then they'll link back to you. There's all sorts of benefits. Uh, User-generated content, so getting comments and interaction down here on the, you know, at the bottom. That type of stuff often is an indication in search engines that, hey, people really care about this. It's also an indication, or it's also a, an addition to the amount of content, and it tends to be very unique and valuable and useful. It talks about, it uses those words that people on the web would be using about the topic, and that can again be helpful for your content optimization. And then finally, Google is clearly looking at things like reading level and correctness of grammar and spelling. There's now a filter inside Google. If you click on the advanced search in the little uh, gearbox in the top hand, right hand corner of your screen, when you're logged into Google, you can see advanced search and you click that, there's a reading level filter to say, oh yeah, only show me content that's sort of you know, 12th grade and above. So clearly Google has that ability. And what I'm saying here is that your content formatting, the way you're putting things together, the length of the document, the, the in-depthness of the correctness, these can all have an impact. Don't just be thinking about keyword stuffing and using a few keywords here and there and putting it in the title at the front. Be thinking a little bit more broadly about your on-page optimization, and you might get more benefits than even doing some link building sometimes. All right, everyone, I hope you've enjoyed this edition of Whiteboard Friday, and we will see you again next week. Take care.